This week, my in-depth conversation with world-renowned human rights activist and Nobel Peace Prize laureate, Dr. Dennis Mukwege. When I'm asking justice for victims, of course, the ones who are not happy and they know who they are, they must be the one who are trying to silence me. Mukwege tells me about his efforts to help women caught in armed conflict end rape as a weapon of war in the DRC and around the world, and why his life-saving work has put his own life in danger. Also, the heated abortion debate in the United States. There are fears the U.S. Supreme Court will undo abortion rights in America. We'll look at how the overturning the landmark Roe v. Wade decision could affect abortion laws in African countries. What does the road ahead look like for those who are pro-life and those who are pro-choice. We'll have in-depth interviews and reporting, expert analysis and your opinion. Straight Talk Africa starts now. Hello there and welcome to Straight Talk Africa. I'm Heidi Adams. Dr. Dennis Mukwege is a world-renowned gynecologist, a human rights activist and a Nobel Peace Prize laureate. He's a global campaigner against the use of rape as a weapon of war and a leading expert in the treatment of injuries and trauma from rape during conflict. Dr. Mukwege runs the Pansy Hospital and Foundation, which he founded in his childhood hometown of Bukavu in the Democratic Republic of Congo. He and his team have treated tens of thousands of survivors there, including the elderly and children. Now he has written a memoir that brings attention to his work combating sexual violence against women and the horror of wartime rape. I sat down with Dr. Mukwege here in Washington recently and talked about his work, threats to his life, and his new book. Dr. Dennis Mukwege, uh, welcome to The Voice of America. Thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for inviting us. Dr. Mukwege, you have a new book out titled The Power of Women, A Doctor's Journey of Hope and Healing. Doctor, what motivated you to write this book and what is at the heart of your message in it? Yeah. This book is the result of my 25 years working with women in a conflict area in the Republic Democratic of Congo in Panzi Hospital. And uh, what I could witness with, uh, in treating women is really that women are strong. And uh, I can see that the resilience of women is really out of all the things that we can imagine. When I receive them after to be rape with extreme violence. And when I say extreme violence, it means that some of them are coming at the hospital with all their genitals destroyed. They have wounded in a very, very bad way. But when women stand up after to be treated, they didn't stand for themselves. They are standing for them and for their children, for the family. And for me, this is really wonderful. If the society can't protect them, but when they got healing and stand up, they stand up and raise their voice, their voice for all the community. This for me is wonderful. And I think that I just feel that I should really, really do a testimony about uh, my journey and show how women are strong even if sometime uh, our system and patriarchal system won't just uh, to silence them. Your book is part personal journey and it's also part call to action. Yeah. What, what is the call to action in your book? Yeah, I think that in this book, if you can read it and, and, and try to see uh, how I, I try to show, I start with my own mother because this is really when I was talking with my mother, I found her that she was really a heroine for me. Because if she, at this moment, she fought for, to, she fought for me and to get me survive the infection, I think that for me, 
when I can see that until today, this was in 1955, but until today, children, babies are still dying with infection after uh, 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 neonatal infection. So I think that what my mother did, when I just start to think about it, I found that she was really a strong woman without education, but she fought against system because the system was, the black was their own system and the white people their own system. She fought against the religion barrier. She was Protestant and the system was a Catholic system. And uh, she, she was poor in a system where really people uh, with nothing, the poor people could not get a voice. So I think that this is what is our women in, in my country, to fight against the social barrier. And uh, in the book, I try to show other women who uh, also are doing the same as my mother. You know, Doctor, often the stories of, of what women who are um, victims and survivors of sexual violence, especially in time of conflict, the stories are so harrowing, they're so graphic, even for, for those of us in the media, you know, we make decisions about which images to show and which not because some we have to warn people about. I guess in a way the wider world is often spared the horror mm. of what happens to women when rape and sexual violence are used as a weapon of war. Uh, what do you think, what do you believe people should know about sexual violence, especially in times of conflict when there's a lot going on? What do you wish people knew that they don't? I think today we can hide uh, behind ignorance and, and just uh, show that oh, we don't know, so we can't act. But for me, I think that they should know everything. Because if we are informed and we know everything, we don't have any excuse to don't act. But today, I think that when women are suffering, especially when it comes to sexual violence, there is a taboo around sexual violence that people are just maintaining. But I can tell you that the problem is that the perpetrators, they know clear that silence is a tool to keep women under control. And if women can keep silence <clears throat> on what happened to them, so perpetrator, rapist can go on raping them. So for me, it should be clear. And what I did in my special situation, I published some images in the medical, um, in, in the in the medical review to show what is happening to women. I did some classification to show the different um, class of uh, women that women can face when when they are raped. It was to try to give information, medical information. But I think that even the population should know exactly what is happening in conflict for women so we, we, we can take action in knowing why we are taking action. But today, my impression is that to don't break silence when it comes to rape is a way for perpetrators to go on so women can suffer, but in a way that no one knows. We have just a word, violence, sexual violence, rape. But what is the meaning of this, this word, rape? But if I can tell you that I, uh, I treated infants, babies, under five years, raped by adults. And you can imagine how they are destroyed. And I think that if people don't see this kind of image because they are afraid to be traumatized. They should think also about all these babies who are raped and destroyed. So for me, we need to respect people, and I respect people. But I think we need to go a little bit further in our knowledge about what is rape in a conflict and how rape is used as a weapon of war. Because rape, when it's used as a weapon of war, it's not for 
the sexual pleasure. It's not for the sexual impulsion. It's for to destroy. It's for to humiliate the community, to destroy women, and to destroy all the society. And for this, I think that we need to get this knowledge so we can act when it happens and act even before it happens. You, doctor, have helped so many survivors of rape and sexual violence. Is there one thing that almost all your, your survivors tell you? Um, is there something that a, a story or, or a feeling that they all seem to have in common uh, and that they find perhaps the hardest to overcome? You know, when I start to treat to, to treat to women victim of rape, I started in my country. And after 10 years, I start to question myself because uh, I just saw things that were terrible. And in reading, I saw that in other places, this kind of rape is happening. And I start to, to meet women in other countries where rape as a weapon of war happened. And I think that there is one war that I found in Asia, South Korea, in Iraq, with Syrian women, with Ethiopian women, Congolese women, in Colombia, and so on. I found this war everywhere. They kill me. They kill me. And I think that we should be we should try to understand when everywhere women, it's not regard the age. I met women who were raped during the Second World War. I met women who were raped during the last conflict in, in Africa, Ethiopia and Congo. I met women uh, of uh, uh, under, under age, but all of them, they are talking the same language. When they rape me, they destroy me. When they rape me, they kill me. When they rape me, there is no future. So I think this feeling of all victims uh, and uh, this feeling that do not depend with their age or where they are living is one of the common things that I'm finding everywhere with the victim. To rape a woman is to destroy her. And most of the women have impression that they don't exist at all after to be, uh, after to be raped. You know, sexual violence is often described as a war within a war, uh, one that often goes, mm. more often than not, goes unpunished. Mm. Uh, can you help us understand, is rape as a weapon of war a war crime? And is it, in many cases, being prosecuted as such? Yeah, uh, I want to maybe to answer before. Rape, when it's used as a weapon of war or a strategy of war, a method of war, it means that rape is used to humiliate, to just make the so-called enemy to feel powerless, to be in a situation that he's completely humiliated and he can't really uh, fight against. So it, it, it's a, a weapon, but it's a, a, a strategy of war. And uh, when it comes, for example, for the DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo, when you can see that there is different methods used by different armed groups. It means that there is a planification because they are using the same group, are using the same method. And when this is used on thousands of, of women by the same group to try to destroy the community, it's a massive, uh, it's a massive use of, of rape as a weapon of war. And I think that in this case, rape can be considered as a crime, a war crime or a crime against humanity. But in other circumstances, rape can be used also as 
uh, ethnic cleansing uh, tool. And there, it can even be uh, considered as a genocide uh, action to, to destroy another, another ethnic group. So, and in this case, rape can be prosecuted and be considered as a crime, a war crime or a crime against humanity. Dr. McQuaggy, when you hear stories and allegations of um, sexual violence against women during a time of conflict coming out of places like Ethiopia's Tigray region or Ukraine, what is your message to the international community about listening to those voices and those stories early on? Um, so uh, I can say that uh, no, maybe I, I, I'm so touched to see how the international community reacts when this happened in Ukraine. Because in three months, we are now, we did some investigations in, in Ukraine. Even my own team, the Mukwege Foundation, was in Ukraine to try to investigate. But uh, we were not there because just we are a foundation working with sexual violence, but, but because also we have already, before this war, who starting that start in in February, our team was already in contact with women in Donbass who were raped in uh, 2014 when uh, Russia invaded for the first time Ukraine. So what happened in Ukraine now? It happened uh, some years ago, and our team were already in contact with women of Ukraine. So my team was there also to try to investigate and try to understand what is going on. So I was saying that I'm so touched to see that the international community can react very fast and put all the means. It's really how the international community should react in each conflict because the suffering is universal. And the reaction against the suffering or to take care of the suffering people should be also universal. And I think that the case of Ukraine show us that if when there is a willing, we have capacity to stop atrocities. And this is a good example to say, we can do the same in Ethiopia. We can do the same in Yemen. In, in Democratic Republic of Congo and everywhere just to, to think that we are sharing the same humanity and when something like that, someone just decide to uh, make uh, another people, put another people in, in suffering, we have to react and stop it, stop it as fast as possible. Dr. McQuigge, did you find, did you and your team find evidence of rape being used as a weapon of war in Ukraine? Our team, they, 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 they met many women and talked with them. And I think that now they are working on how to collect evidences and uh, to try to support them. But there is one thing, to collect evidence when uh, uh, rape happened in the war is not an easy thing. Because when it happened, most of the time, women are treated as slaves. And uh, when they can be free, it's uh, most of the time late to get all the proofs that are needed. But I think that today, we, we can't count only on the physical evidence. We have also psychological evidence. And all these things put together, and the uh, testimony of victims, we have also to, to, to get confident in the testimony of, of victims. And I think that we can get physical evidence, we can get also psychological evidence and the testimony. And I think all this coming together, we can say that evidence is possible to get it even in, during the, the, uh, the conflict. Dr. McQuay, you have helped literally tens of thousands of victims and survivors of um, sexual violence and other types of violations in, in times of conflict and elsewhere. Uh, you have, of course, 
a Nobel Peace Prize for, for your efforts, which you won in 2018. Why are there stories of uh, threats against your life? Who do you believe is targeting you and why? Yeah. I think that when I'm talking about justice, calling for justice for victims, there are many who are not happy about this. And uh, I'm sorry for it because I think that justice is very important. It's not a revenge. Justice is not only repression against the perpetrators, but justice is needed for victims because in the process of healing, victims need really, really to be recognized as a victim. They need really to get someone who has this power, this authority to say, you are not guilty, it's not your fault. And this is very important. Sometimes we are, we, we are just treating victims that, okay, you get everything so you can be quiet. But sometimes they need only to get this word to say, we recognize that we didn't protect you. It was our fault as a community. We should protect you. And I think to give this to victims is very important because it's the possibility for them to rebuild their new life, knowing that it's happened to me, but I'm not blamed by my community and myself. I know that it happened to me, but it was not my fault. So justice is very important for victims and survivors because it's helped them to rebuild a new life with confidence in themselves. And uh, when I'm asking justice for victims, of course, the ones who are not happy and they know who they are, they must be the ones who are trying to silence me. But I think that uh, even if they succeed to do so, but justice will not change and victim will still there to ask justice for what happened to them. Uh, do you fear for your life sometimes, Dr. McQuiggy? Are you afraid? I'm human, and uh, I don't want to be a uh, hero uh, dead. I want to really to go on doing what I'm doing, and uh, I'm trying to, to be a little bit, uh, uh, to get my life uh, uh, not as I would like to, uh, to do, because now I'm living in the hospital, I can't leave the hospital without escort. I have the UN uh, uh, police who are taking care of me. And you know, to get this kind of life, living in the hospital with your patients and my family and so on, this is a third thing. It's because I'm trying to protect my life so I can go on doing what, what I'm doing. But to give up, I think that this is not something that I'm thinking that I can do. The women I'm treating are so powerful. And uh, if I can compare their life to my life, I think that what I'm doing is just a small sense if I compare for what they are doing in the situation of conflict where everyone wants to use them to treat them as uh, uh, animals and destroy them. So I think that what I'm doing, I'm doing it because I have also women around me who are really very strong. Dr. Dennis McQuaggy, you certainly are an inspiration and we do thank you that you chose to spend time with us today and tell us a little more about your work and your experiences and your book, of course. We wish you all the best in your work going forward. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for giving us this opportunity to talk about the book. My interview there with Nobel Peace Prize laureate Dr. Dennis Mukwege from the Democratic Republic of Congo, who spoke to me recently here in Washington. Well, still ahead here on Straight Talk Africa, we'll tackle the heated abortion debate in the United States and what that could mean for countries across Africa and other parts of the world. We've got in-depth reporting, expert analysis, and we'll hear what ordinary people on the streets of Abuja and Johannesburg have to say about a woman's right to have an abortion. That discussion coming up after the break. Back in a moment. Health, wellness, sport, beauty, medical breakthroughs. 
Healthy Living cares about your well-being. What are the main health concerns in Africa and around the world? Find out the latest on coronavirus. Connect with our experts and ask them questions. How long does the virus stay? Join me, Lino Khmudu, in Washington every week on Healthy Living. Right here on VOA. Welcome back. The right of American women to have an abortion could be severely restricted if the U.S. Supreme Court reverses its 1973 decision to legalize the procedure. VOA's Veronica Balderas Iglesias spoke to activists on three continents and found concern about what a U.S. ruling overturning Roe versus Wade could have around the world. It started before they were born, but now young people in the U.S. are joining the abortion rights debate full throttle. No no this group walked out of school to demand that abortion remains a privacy right under the U.S. Constitution. This is not only going to affect the women who are getting pregnant now, it's going to affect the women getting pregnant in the future, and it's going to affect all future generations if this is overturned. Also among the young are those who condemn abortion. They are energized after a draft Supreme Court opinion leaked to the public, indicating that the landmark 1973 ruling making abortion legal is in jeopardy. If that's the final ruling, the 50 states would decide what's allowed, and many want to ban or severely restrict abortion. Hopefully the Supreme Court makes the right decision and we're able to send the issue of abortion back to the states and really start hitting the issue of abortion um, in our local communities. Could other countries follow? The world is watching closely. When the United States takes such a bold and obvious anti-rights movement, other countries find cover in that. They use that as cover for then the anti-rights work that they do, specifically but not exclusively around reproductive rights and the right to abortion. Globally, 970 million women live in countries that broadly allow abortion, according to the U.S.-based Center for Reproductive Rights. Still, two in five women of childbearing age who want or need an abortion face restrictions. A mujer alguna? Mexico's high court ruled last year to decriminalize abortion, but only eight of Mexico's 32 states have taken steps to legalize it. What is happening in the U.S. is a warning sign, say Mexican backers of abortion rights. What the U.S. is teaching us is that our rights are always at risk, given that political environments could change. Anti-rights groups are always trying to come up with strategies to block access to women's rights. In Geneva, Switzerland, reproductive rights advocates aren't too worried about repercussions in Europe where abortion is broadly permitted. Poland, Malta, Liechtenstein, Andorra and Monaco are the five countries in Europe that still retain what we call highly restrictive abortion laws. My view is that the trend will remain overwhelmingly positive in terms of moving to recognition of abortion as essential health care. In Africa, only a few countries allow abortion upon request. One is South Africa, which legalized abortion in 1996. But opposition to reproductive rights could grow there with a U.S. reversal. In some of our facilities, there are people outside um, protesting, um, trying to um, prohibit the women from going into our facilities. The more that uh, it is reversed in other countries, then the same um, will apply um, in South Africa because people will just become bolder. The World Health Organization says restricting abortion doesn't stop it and that 23,000 women die each year from complications after unsafe abortions. Anti-abortion groups we interviewed dispute that argument. They want the U.S. to roll back a 49-year-old right they see as immoral. Most people don't understand how truly radical the American abortion laws are. We would hope that this would have an impact around the world uh, because when governments do tend to change their laws, they often cite American law. The way to compromise here is to help women uh, get through their pregnancies by providing them with housing, with medical care that they need, uh, with formula, clothing, and all of that. When the Supreme Court might issue its abortion ruling is uncertain. But when it does, the shockwaves 
could search far beyond U.S. shores. Veronica Valderas Iglesias for VOA News, Washington. Well, now for a deeper look at the abortion debate in the United States is VOA's congressional correspondent, Catherine Gibson. She's here with me in studio. Catherine, warm welcome to Straight Oak Africa. Thanks so much. So you've been on Capitol Hill covering this story. And of course, we see the abortion debate has now gained, um, you know, new urgency. Um, and this is after someone, let me get this straight, someone at the U.S. Supreme Court leaked a staffer, presumably, presumably, leaked to the press a first draft of the court's opinion on whether the U.S. Constitution protects a woman's right to have an abortion. That's right. We presume that that's a Supreme Court staffer because the U.S. Supreme Court is so tightly protected and secretive. It is one of the most secretive institutions in the United States, and that's really to maintain the independence of the judiciary here in the United States. So when that draft opinion leaked here in the United States, it's hard to underestimate the magnitude of the reaction to that, especially for a decision of this size that will affect millions of American women. It was a huge surprise that we would really get some insight into the thinking of the justices before they even release that opinion in the next few weeks. So it's really a lot of discussion about was this a staffer who wanted to support the pro-life cause, a staffer who wanted to support the pro-choice cause, all sorts of theories, but we really don't have an any answers about who actually did that. We just know that this really reignited the abortion debate in the United States. Right, and an uproar indeed on two fronts, of course, who leaked it and of course the, what the opinion actually said. And, and the fact that the court may come down um, this way, uh, was that a real surprise? In all reality, no. It was shocking for many people in the United States to actually see this in writing for the first time and understand that the court is indeed going to go ahead with this decision. But we knew the basic makeup of the U.S. Supreme Court here in the United States is that it leans towards conservative justices who have been appointed by Republican U.S. presidents, six of those justices, as opposed to three more liberal-leaning justices who were appointed by Democratic presidents. Just the basic numbers tell us that this decision was going to come down the pipeline. Now, Catherine, there was an attempt in Congress to codify the right to an abortion. Tell us what happened there. Right, because the out uproar in this country after that draft decision was leaked was so huge. Congressional Democrats felt like they really needed to do something and take some action. In reality, they actually can't do a whole lot, even though they control the U.S. Senate. There are a couple of different procedural rules that are a little bit arcane, but they're very, very important. They basically need 60 votes to advance and get to a debate on this rule codifying abortion protections in the United States. And of course, as we know, Democrats only have a 50 person majority with that tie-breaking vote in the person of Vice President Kamala Harris. That is not enough to proceed forward, and they failed on that effort. Now, in the setup story we saw earlier, an activist mentioned that decisions around whether or not abortion should be legal in the United States should not be made at a national level, but that it should go back to the states to decide what to do. Can you help us understand, especially for our non-U.S. Mm -hmm. audience, how is it in the United States of America that abortion can be legal in one place and not in another? I think it's a really complicated question that many Americans themselves don't understand. And so when we hear that pro-life activists say that they want it to go back to the state level, that's been a big talking point for their movement in the past few years, is that a decision of this magnitude should not be left up to the federal government to make decisions about people's personal health, that it should trickle down to more of a state level. And that's how things work here in this country is that we have a federal system where we have law, different laws in each state and the state legislatures make those decisions because the theory is that they're closer to the people they represent so they're making better decisions for their own individual states. And, and just walk us through this here. What do activists on both sides of this debate want ultimately? want ultimately is a huge question here in the United States because pro-life activists say that overturning Roe v. Wade is something that they have worked towards for decades. So this is indeed a big moment for them. What lies in the background of all of these debates is whether they also want to put some bans on contraception, because pro-life activists say that some forms of contraception 
also constitute abortion in their view, things like IUDs, things like the morning after plan B pill. I'm seeing that after they have this overturn of Roe v. Wade, they're going to want to turn their attention to banning those forms of contraception as well. And on the other side, it's simple. The pro-choice activists want to see protection for abortion and contraception at the federal level so that this can never happen again. Now, we're already seeing states trying to prohibit people from um, actually crossing state lines and going to get an abortion in another state where it might be legal. Can this actually end up happening? And um, what options would people really have, not just inside their own country, going from state to state, but also outside the United States? And will we actually see Americans go to places like Canada and Mexico? to get an abortion. Right, well I think what you'll see is you'll see wealthier, higher income Americans, they will always have access to abortion, whether that's buying a plane ticket to go to the state of New York where abortion is protected at the state level, or even like you said, going to Mexico, going overseas, because they have access to those funds. The problem is we know that the majority of women seeking abortion here in the United States are women in their 20s who are lower income, who will absolutely not be able to buy those plane tickets, who will not have the funds to cross state lines. There are a lot of other rules and procedures in place with waiting periods where women have to undergo counseling, where they can't go in one visit to a doctor to obtain an abortion, and that's a lot of money. If you're talking about crossing state lines, getting a hotel room for the night, that's just not possible for a lot of women. And like with many things, it all comes down to economics, of course. Right. Now, if the U.S. Supreme Court decides to ban abortion, an estimated 26 states are likely to, to ban it and to follow suit. Is this actually in sync with American public opinion? <laughs> American public opinion about abortion is really complicated and nuanced because we're talking about a range of questions that they can be asked. Are you in support of overturning Roe versus Wade, the federal protection, the constitutional right to an abortion? We know straight up that a little bit of a majority of Americans don't want to see Roe v. Wade overturned. And that's actually gone up a couple of public opinion points just since this draft opinion was leaked. So a slight majority there for keeping Roe v. Wade in place. Then it gets a little more nuanced when you ask about whether it should be in cases of rape or incest, to protect the life of the mother, to detect fetal abnormalities, and then, you know, end the pregnancy. There's a lot of complicated shifting feelings among the public. In most cases, in cases of rape and incest, people absolutely support the right to abortion here in the United States. Uh, Catherine, it seems like this is just the beginning of a fight and not the end, of course. What do activists here worry will be the next battleground? Well, we already know that in, in states America's like culture wars, <laughs> I know. Many. in states like Texas, you know, the chances are they're saying that a woman was prosecuted for having a miscarriage and that they could pursue things like that. If a woman, you know, is suspected of having an abortion, of using certain, you know, pills that you can buy online, they could argue that she terminated her pregnancy intentionally and then pursue criminal prosecutions. That's really a fear for the pro-choice side on this issue. Well, we'll keep our eyes peeled and keep looking at what goes on in the story and what happens next. And we'll have you back on here to help mm -hmm. lay things out for us. Thank you so much, Catherine Gibson. There is VOA's congressional correspondent. We do thank her for her time. And we're going to take uh, another break here on Straight Talk Africa. And when we come back, we look at the impact of the abortion debate on countries in Africa. Are they leaning towards more restrictive or more liberal abortion laws? That's after the break. But before we get there, though, we asked people on the streets of Abuja, Nigeria, whether they think a woman should have the right to terminate her pregnancy. Why will you go and commit abortion? Why will you kill? Abortion is murder to me. So why killing? If you know you don't want the child, why going into such a thing for you to get pregnant at the first time? But if you now talk of the area of uh, maybe the pregnancy is putting the woman at risk, maybe that is on head ground. Yes, that can be done. I, as a person, I believe that God 
Mm -hmm. Understand that. A family that goes to sleep and they get robbed by arm robbers. And they not, they, not, they not only rob, they rape their daughter. Now, the daughter finds out that she's pregnant. Her dream shattered, education to a halt. I think there are many reasons why she should opt for that option. It's a no-no. I have two principles why I say it's a no-no. The act of sex, as it were, either by fornication or by marital blessing, is what may be prohibited. But the child, pregnancy is a blessing by all standards. It's going to encourage a lot of premarital sex. As, as adults, you know, I think um, as an adult, there are protective measures for this, for unwanted pregnancy. So I don't see any need for people to allow themselves to get pregnant, unwanted, unwanted pregnancy. And at the end of the day, you want to abort it. It's not nice. Women should have the entire and sole right to be able to choose for themselves what they want, either to abort or to keep the baby. women should be able to choose what they do with their bodies. Yeah, there's a strong topic, but I do feel like they should have a right to abortion, yes. It's a difficult one, but I'm actually against it. Yeah, she should have a right to, to abort, you know, especially teenage pregnancies, you know, the things that are not intentional. I feel like sometimes women are, some women are not, uh, like, ready to have, what should they do when they're not ready to have a baby, you know? Um, Especially in this day and age, you have guys who are selfish, you know. Guys would do the weirdest things to stay in a relationship with a person or to just have a connection with them. So as a guy, I have these topics with gents and most, not most of them, but I've come across conversations where guys would say like, nah, I had to make a pregnant to stay in a relationship or to have a connection with us still as time goes. And I feel like that's selfish and it's wrong. So what should the woman do in that case? Because now she's bringing a baby into the world that she didn't plan to have. I do feel like women should have the right to abortion. I've seen movies about it. I've seen that movie, I can't remember, where, Unplanned. So I know what abortion entails. And I know there's people that's really struggling and so on. But what you do to that little baby, it's a child from conception. It's a person, I think it will be absolutely amazing if it can be stopped. If those people that want to have abortions can be helped in a different way. So if America stops it and even worldwide, I think it will be really amazing. It's your body maybe, but that child is a child. So I don't believe in my body, my choice. Simply because it's their bodies and just like everyone gets to choose what they wear, women should be able to have the right to say, I want a child, I want the responsibility of a child, or I don't. It's no one else's choice. Well, South Africans, they're on the streets of Johannesburg telling us what they think about a woman's right to get an abortion. So, what, does the, what do the laws in African countries look like? Are we seeing more countries restrict or liberalize abortion laws? And for a look at the legal landscape now, I'm joined by Evelyn Opondos from the Center for Reproductive Rights. She joins me uh, from Nairobi. She is the regional director for Africa. And also with us is Anne Kiyoko. She's also in Nairobi, and she is the campaigns director for Africa and the United Nations at the outfit called Citizen Go. Ladies, welcome to the show. So great to have you both here. Thank you for having us. Um, Evelyn, I'm going to start with you and I want to pull up a map by the Center for Reproductive Rights and this sort of gives you an idea of uh, what laws look like in African countries where it is lawful to have an abortion in order to save a woman's life, to preserve a woman's health 
on socioeconomic grounds and on request. So uh, can you, Evelyn, please walk us through some of these scenarios where women can get an abortion in African countries? Thank you. Um, I think first I want to start by stating that Africa is the only region globally that has a human rights instrument that explicitly provides for access to abortion. This is under uh, the, the Women's Protocol, which we also call the Maputo Protocol, which has been ratified by a number of countries, 43 countries out of 54 countries uh, in Africa. And when we look at abortion um, rights or abortion laws in Africa, between the year 2000 and 2019, we have 25 African countries that have expanded their legal grounds on abortion. We have a number of countries, DRC, for example, expanded its laws in 2018 to align it with Maputo Protocol that allows for access to abortion in cases of rape, fetal impairment, in cases uh, where the health or the life of the mother is in danger. We also have countries such as Gabon, we have countries such as Cote d'Ivoire uh, that have expanded their laws, countries such as Rwanda that have also expanded their laws to include instances of rape, fetal uh, impairment, where the life of the woman is in danger. And we also have uh, more recently in 21, 2021, uh, Benin that has also expanded its laws to allow for abortion in cases um, that where the gestational period is under 12 weeks. So we have been seeing progress in the last few years in Africa. But I must say that there's still a lot more work for us to do. Uh, Anne, and I wanted to make that example about Benin last year becoming the latest African country to legalize abortion in most cases. Now, when you look at abortion laws across the continent, what's been the trend from your perspective? Uh, is your side of the debate making headway or holding ground in Africa, or are more liberal laws taking hold? Thank you so much. Uh, now, when it comes to Africa and to, to the laws and to policies, I would say that um, uh, there's nothing like uh, pro progress when it comes to uh, abortion because first, who is uh, legalizing this? Uh, uh, who is legalizing abortion? Who is pushing for abortion? I, I like the interviews you have done. Uh, in Abuja, in South Africa, and you have seen for yourself, the people on the ground are opposed to abortion. An example of Benin, last year they, the parliament uh, had a lot of pressure, they um, uh, passed a law to uh, permit abortion, but then how is the country, what is the country's uh, population uh, position about abortion? They are very divided on the issue, and implementation, I can tell you and I can assure you, implementation of that law will be very problematic. So uh, uh, we cannot uh, say that uh, because uh, we are trying to uh, push for laws, uh, we have been fighting quite a lot, uh, quite a lot of uh, laws that have been planted in, every, in most of the uh, African countries. Here in Kenya, we had an abortion law uh, that was in the Senate. In Malawi, there was an abortion law. In Namibia, so there's a lot of that pressure to legalize abortion in Africa. But then, are uh, Africans are supporting abortion? It's a no. In Kenya, uh, in 2020, Ipsos survey says that 85% of Kenyans are opposed to abortion. So you can sign all these kind of laws, you can sign all these kind of documents, but it doesn't make abortion uh, uh, um, a right, it doesn't make abortion uh, anything less than murder. People are, in Africa, they agree that abortion is murder and we can never change that. It kills, it stops the life of a preborn baby, it is, uh, stops a heartbeat, and this is not going to change today or with any other kind of law. And I'm happy that um, uh, we are having people realize that uh, laws that are, are, are meant to, uh, to, to push for abortion are not doing us uh, good. And I just want to say earlier, when we spoke to people in South Africa and in, um, in Nigeria, of course, that's not scientific. It is a small, small segment of people that we spoke to um, either way. So a little hard to draw um, any uh, inferences from that. But Evelyn, earlier we saw a story about how what happens in the United States definitely has, um, around abortion, definitely has ripple effects in other parts of the world. In your view, does the same hold true for African countries? 
Of course, um, in Africa, we are also alive to the debates that are going on uh, globally. We are watching keenly what's happening in the U.S., uh, particularly around the leaked opinion of one judge. Um, but we are also cognizant of the progress that's being made globally, particularly when you look at the Latin America region. Uh, we talked, we've seen progress in Mexico, in Argentina, in Colombia, and we are inspired by that progress. And, you know, as much as we also look at what is happening in the U.S., we must also remain true to our reality. On the ground, those who are dying from unsafe abortion, you know, the issues of abortion remain issues on the ground. And we must be, um, we must speak to our reality on the ground. And I want you to get to some other parts of that reality a little later on because, you know, it would be interesting to note about um, what role economics play, play um, where people live, what kind of education levels they have, what their cultural and religious beliefs are. But and to what extent does, in your view, the debate here in the United States resonate across the continent? What's your perspective on that? Well, uh, this uh, ruling, uh, and I turned about uh, the ruling that uh, the Roe versus Wade, it has really been uh, quite um, bad on us in, in Africa, in, globally, because it started by Roe versus Wade, and it extended globally. And you, you realize that uh, whatever happens, like you rightfully said, whatever happens in the United States affects a lot what happens in Africa, because Africa is still developing. And if you do not, uh, um, uh, presidents like uh, President Obama, when he was a president, he extended billions of money to come to Africa to extend uh, these laws to make sure that abortion is legalized uh, 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 in Africa. And uh, I imagine that um, if this is overturned, it will be very good and very good uh, position for us in Africa because, like I've told you, Africans do not believe in killing their babies. And whatever uh, it comes with uh, uh, um, money from the United States, comes with a, con a lot of conditions. Uh, you have to legalize abortion, you have to legalize this and the, uh, con uh, sexualization of children, you have to legalize co contraception for children. So uh, it will be very, very uh, welcome decision if they choose to overturn Roe versus Wade. It will be a welcome um, uh, decision. We'll be very excited and we're praying, um, fingers crossed that uh, this is overturned. It is long overdue. We have to stop using law to kill babies, to uh, to kill preborn babies that are innocent. Because we cannot uh, uh, keep on uh, extending laws instead of addressing the issues. Why are we having uh, these unwanted pregnancies? Why can't we address ourselves? to sex before marriage? Why can't we uh, address ourselves to whatever is causing this unwanted, what they call unwanted pregnancy? I don't believe there's any unwanted pregnancy uh, in this world because before a baby is formed, there is an action and people consenting to it. And it's, uh, unfortunately, there's a few that uh, don't consent and there's, they are lost to that effect. Sexual offenses act like here in Kenya, there is one. And uh, what we need to do is implement such kind of laws. So, Basically, we cannot be uh, using laws to uh, extend murdering of preborn babies. And I'm very and excited. Where to are you? On. Where are you on on this um, on this debate? Are all abortions equal to you in your view? Uh, do you make room for any exceptions, Anne? Abortion, whether done in the United States, abortion, whether done in Kibra, a, a local slum in Kenya, abortion is murder, and we can never. Uh, college, anything else. It's murder. So, so can I put it to you, should a 12-year-old, for example, who has been raped by an uncle or a father, be forced to carry that child to term? Here we are looking at uh, an issue, sexual violence. And I've said that there are laws that should be extended, they should be used, they should be maximized to address certain of issues. But what what uh, the debate uh, surrounds itself in is looking at the baby, the innocent baby that is unfortunately uh, formed out of that uh, violence. So, so we resort to um, uh, killing a baby uh, with another, um, out of another violence. So, 
it's a violence with another violence. But it's very unfortunate that we have such kind of a situation. So let's address the law. Let's cancel this girl. Let's uh, look at the best opportunities to save uh, the baby and also to make sure that this 12-year-old has a better future. Because you cannot tell me that when we uh, uh, ask a baby, to, uh, this girl, to have an abortion, they will be happy. Abortions have been um, uh, studied and they have they have been seen to cause uh, uh, emotional trauma. Uh, we have uh, so many women that come out, they say abortions have affected them. So what are you subjecting this girl to? Violence, with another violence, with another violence. Let's look for solutions. If this baby can be carried to term and given for adoption, and then we look for a solution to, make, to take this girl to counseling and to make sure that the perpetrator of this violence is um, subjected to maximum... And I want to get, book. I want, my, my apologies, I want to get to Evelyn quickly because we don't have a lot of time here. Um, Evelyn, in the United States, we see this rural urban split of sorts um, in terms of how people feel about um, abortion and a woman's right to have an abortion. Of course, um, in the cities, you tend to have more um, liberal views in rural areas, not. Um, does the same apply in, in countries in Africa that you have seen that there is this urban rural split? First of all, I have to clarify this issue of the law. Whatever is happening in the U.S. will not change the implementation of our laws. The laws of the various countries will stand as they are in spite of raw. The raw decision may be persuasive, but it does not change any law. African countries will determine what their laws are. Having said that, you, your question is about the rural versus um, the urban areas. Correct. You know, unsafe abortion affects mostly those who are not econ economically uh, able to get abortion that's safe. And so whether there is law that prohibits abortion, women will have abortion. The only difference is that women, a majority of women will have unsafe abortion. And majority of these are women who are in the rural areas or even the urban poor. In the urban areas, when you look across Africa, you'll find that uh, there tends to be a lot more information around access, around how people, even around the laws, around how people can access such services. And the people in the rural areas tend to suffer the most. Also, because when you look at the range of providers who have um, the capacity to provide these services, they tend to be more in the, in the urban areas. And therefore, you will find that those who are in the rural areas have less access. But I would not say that you know, uh, the opinion of those who are in the rural areas is against the ocean. In any case, nobody has really done that sort of solid study scientific study that we can rely on. And when you look at all the African countries, you cannot blanketly place them together and say Africans are against abortion. This will even differ our country, but even within country. This has to be more nuanced. We cannot just make these blanket uh, statements that are not backed by evidence. Uh, I also wanted to say that, you know, when you look at the U.S., whatever happens in the U.S., and, and whatever happens with Roe uh, will not affect, affect U.S. foreign policy. We do know that Africa, I mean, I mean, America is also in conflict with itself. Look at the outrage on the street. Look at what is happening uh, in court. Compare that what, with the message that we are getting from the executive. And so we are seeing this for what it is. Americans are not all united in one, uh, you know, around one opinion. Ladies, I do have to end this conversation here. I do wish we had more time to do our back and forth on this issue, and I will invite you back again because this is an ongoing conversation. Thank you so much, Anne Kiyoko and Evelyn Opondo. I do thank you both for your time. And that is where we will leave it for this week. A big thank you to all my guests for their time and perspectives. And of course, to our affiliate stations airing Straight Talk Africa across the continent and to you, our audience. Thank you for always watching and always listening. And I will see you.